So very good. Good morning, everybody, to another webinar of the European Heat Pump Association. We will talk about uh, the Heat Pump City of the Year Award 2019 today, and uh, we dubbed the event as Discover the Award Winners of 2019. My name is uh, Thomas Novak. I'm the Secretary General, and I have with me the five presenters that will explain uh, that I will introduce in due course. Just allow me a few words about the European Heat Pump Association. We are a member-based association with 130 members. We are uh, active in 22 countries and we have representatives of the full value chain. There is heat pump manufacturers, component manufacturers, national associations, consultants, research and test institutes, and they come from nearly every part of Europe, as you can see here. Um, we are registered in Brussels and we are advocating with the EU institutions. The EHPA, as you can see here, represents the majority of players and we, we claim that we are the voice and uh, we can speak this heat pump language uh, towards the policy makers. Our main vision is to enable heat pump technologies for their specific advantages when it comes to the use of renewables, waste heat, uh, but also for sector integration. And so we have called this uh, a sustainable and smart energy system. The Heat Pump City of Our Year Award is the result of something that we encountered in the past. We realized that people did not know enough about where heat pumps can be used, and specifically they had no picture in mind. They did not uh, see what, what a heat pump could look like. It's very obvious if you see a photovoltaic system, it's very visible if you see a whole landscape full of windmills and you may or may not like it, but heat pumps are just disappearing. They are in the basement, they, you could even say they compete against the equipment level of the bathroom or of the kitchen because uh, it's also this water connected installer base that is, uh, that is working on them and sometimes you want the visible thing more than the in invisible even though the invisible, what the heat pump does, the invisible contribution is better for the environment so in the end also for ourselves. And so we created this, we created a the Heat Pump City of a Year Award originally again as one award, so there was only one category that you could win in the end. What we wanted to do is create a multiplication potential with those cities and administrations that gave specific recognition to the technology. So what we had in mind, you could say these things are always developing, what we had in mind was uh, something like a city may, creates a new building area, a new development area and says, OK, here we want to have a majority of heat pumps. And it worked like that in the beginning, but then we got requests by other parties who said, but look, we have a very good uh, renovation program. We have a very good uh, in industrial project and we have a very good technology development. And we realized that we need to do more categories and we did this. And we did this over nine editions. We have uh, 18 projects awarded. You can see original, the, the mass doesn't add up if it was only one event. So we had to, uh, we, we added more, the more categories and we have more than 155 applications. And these applications are now also becoming a stock of examples that we can circulate with other parties. And the applications come from 20 countries all around the world, not only Europe, but also outside Europe. And you can see here the winners edition of 2019. You see uh, the, the happy winners on, uh, in, the, in the picture here at the award ceremony carrying the, the different uh, awards. And we awarded this time as the Heat Pump City of the Year. So the overall award, award went to the best seven in the EU Google, uh, the city of Tampa. And the project is, is quite unique because it allows also the, sell, the selling of, uh, of waste energy to the, to the energy mix. And it is a very good example of how heat pumps can serve as a system integration tool. Then when it comes to industry, you may say if you're a bit more knowledgeable about the sector, ah, that's not really new because every dairy plant has a heat pump today. And maybe that's even too true, but we will see why um, the uh, Bergen project got, got the award because that was also the connection to the district heating system in a very innovative way. And then we have the next generation heat pump system that will be presented uh, later on by Energy Tech in uh, the Netherlands and in the building category. Uh, we, we awarded the award to Tronova, which is, uh, again, I would say a very good example of system uh, of building integration of the heat pump technology. Very briefly, the next edition will be the 10th edition. So those of you that are not presenting, that are just listening, if you know of a good project, if you have maybe done one yourself that you think is worthwhile um, presenting and, and applying for with the award, do it, give the project a try, send the application to us. We start collecting applications 1st of January uh, under the HPCY uh, email address, or you can check on the website.
And we think that it's a very good award by now. It has received good recognition. And what I should also say is that we are continuing to work with cities. So actually, these examples will make the city that is part of the deal or the, uh, the region that is part of the deal will give them more visibility. And with that, I would like to, uh, to end. And I'm looking forward to the presentations. Um, I would like to introduce to you the presenters in the order that they that they occur. There is first Mr. Janne Heinonen from Enamix Oi in Finland, who will present the best seven project. We have with us Richard Hornfeld from Norway, uh, who will introduce the Trina dairy plant. We will have we have with us Jochen von Haren, who is the owner of uh, Energy Tech, and he will talk about uh, the PHAC system in Achtmal in the Netherlands. And last but not least is Nike. Relik Wasowski from um, Boydens Energy Engineering. Boydens, um, Mr. Boydens himself was one of our board members and a very dedicated guy towards heat pumps. So I'm very happy to have Boydens also represented here. But with that, without any further ado, please uh, go ahead. Please, can I remind you to keep the time because we want to allow a few questions and we start with Janne Heinonen from Enemix Oi. Janne. So I'm sharing the screen. Okay, can you hear my and see my screen? Yes. Yes. Just a second. Okay. I have here uh, Mr. Perti Westerlin with me, and he's the chairman of the board of this uh, housing company. And if you allow, uh, I give him a first minute to give his uh, regards on, on this project, and then I will start my presentation. So, Please. Hello, everybody. I thank you for this award. You can see and you have met it, and I'm very proud of this. And now, Janne, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I will introduce you in the next 15 minutes about this uh, project. And this is actually a, a very first apartment building in Finland and probably in Europe as well, where we have been uh, developing this kind of two-way district heating uh, with negative carbon footprint. So first, if you look at the building itself, uh, you can see a picture here and it's a 70 apartments building, a little bit more than 100 people living it, living there and location here in Finland. Tampere city, which is a central center part of Finland. There have been, has been uh, renovations made in a couple of phases. First renovation in 2014, and second one in 2017. There has been a lot of media uh, focus here as well over the years. So more than 50 media events has been held by Perti locally. Uh, more than 800 people visiting the site to see what's, what, what has been done and many seminars given in different uh, situations where more than 3,000 people has, has heard about this project in Finland. This is partly funded by EU. It's, it's called EU Google Pro Program, which is uh, funding these kind of um, projects where energy is, is saved a lot. So the first renovation step was done in 2014. And what was done in, the, in that stage was that exhausted air heat pump was installed to the building and together with the solar collectors. So, uh, and, and all these, the, in, at this phase, we just kind of reduced uh, all the energy usage uh, using heat pump technology uh, together with the district heating. And then the second phase was the actual a bigger phase, I would say that uh, there was a ground source heat pump added. There, were, there are five um, wells where we get the energy from the ground. There is also added a wastewater heat recovery. There are also solar panels on the roof uh, that gathers the electricity at 21 kilowatt uh, capacity. And then there is uh, cooling in each apartment, passive cooling using the uh, heat pump, heat pumps again. 
And the last, but not definitely the least, is this two-way district heating, uh, which really allows that air, all the uh, ex excessive energy that the building doesn't consume, but the heat pumps can produce, those are sold to the district heating network. If we look at uh, energy consumption over the years, so starting from 2010, almost 10 years, uh, one decade here, we can see that it has come down very nicely. And this is really the purchased district heating energy. And the estimation for this year is that it's, it's almost zero. And if we looked in the last five years or four, four years or so, uh, the heating energy uh, from the district heating network has been actually replaced with the local production by heat pumps. And in the left graph, we can see the electricity part, which is the green, green bar there, and the uh, dark gray is the district heating energy usage. And we can see here in the last year that the gray part is actually negative. And this is the amount of energy building has sold back to the grid. And the second graph is actually showing the greenhouse gas emission. So instead of, uh, of, of, of pushing emissions to the atmosphere, that this building is actually negative, has a negative footprint. And this is due to the fact that the electricity used by the heat pumps is 100% renew renewable. Uh, <clears throat> Next uh, picture actually shows a little bit technical picture. And this is uh, how, how this prime side of the heat pump system is, is uh, built. In the, there are numbers one to one to six. So number one is, is the dwells, five dwells to get the energy from the ground. Number two represents the exhausted air heat recovery units. There are three units altogether. Number three is the solar, solar collectors to, to uh, harvest the solar energy to the prime side. Number four is the wastewater heat recovery unit. So it's a boiler that actually wastewater goes through and it moves the heat energy back to the brine uh, pipeline. And then number five is the cooling part of the, or each apartment has a passive cooling. So all the heat, excessive heat energy is again gathered to the brine side of the heat pump. And then the last number six is the uh, 21 kilowatt uh, capacity PV panels. And that, that energy or electricity it is mainly used by the heat pump compressors. Mm, then the next slide is actually showing the connection that how the heat pump produces the excessive energy back to the district heating network. So the left side heat pump heats the, uh, the boilers there. There are two boilers on the left side. And then when all the conditions are met and, and it's possible to sell, the system will start to push the energy back to the district heating network. And here we can see actually the energy usage over the five years. Uh, in the first renovation part, where the, all these graphs begins, that was the phase when these exhaustive air heat recovery units were installed. And we can see that the blue, blue bar here, or blue curves, those are the district heating energy consumption Green one are the energy produced locally by the heat pumps. And this is a one year cycle, then it's a summertime and next year cycle, and so forth. In the middle part of the graph, you can see the blue, 
blue line here. This is the COB of the heat pump, actually the system level COB level. And we can actually see, it's not very clear here, but it varies from three to four, typically in the, this kind of exhausted air heat recovery systems. And then the second renovation happened in uh, one and a half year ago. And that was the phase when all this, all this new stuff was installed. And we can see here that in the springtime 2018, the building started to sell the energy back to the grid. And the sold energy amount is this third graph here, which is showing blue, blue uh, bars. And, and, the, and the lowest graph is actually the average temperature outside. So we can see here that after the second renovation, a few months later, when the system was up and running properly, the building completely, almost completely stopped consuming the district heating. And it's, it's, it's really getting all the energy needed locally on site and also selling the excessive heating back to the grid. So that's actually my presentation. So I thank you and I hope that uh, I, I kept the timeline you gave us. <laughs> yes, that was perfect. Thank you, Janne. And I think it's really a good example on how heat pumps serve as a system integration tool and connect uh, solar thermal waste heat, uh, passive cooling or passive, uh, yeah, passive cooling, you said, and photovoltaic and the district heating system. So. It's even better to see that uh, this made sense from an economic perspective, because often you would say automatically, ah, this is too complicated, so it's probably also too expensive. I would like to give the floor to uh, the audience if there is any question. The tool allows that you raise your hands. I don't see any, but if, if there is somebody that would like to ask a question uh, um, at the moment, then please raise your hand now. Until I see anybody, I would like to ask one question. Do you see uh, a, a replication potential? Are other cities in Finland or maybe outside Finland interested in copying the approach? Yeah, that's a good question. And in fact, we have a, another project starting where we have been discussing how to scale this up really. And there is really a potential. The, the one of the downside of this, this particular case is that the heat pump temperature that it can produce is not high enough, which typically is required by the Finnish, Finnish district heating network. And that is the probably the only major blocking issue for scaling up. And we are trying to solve that together with the heat, heat pump manufacturers to, to have a commercially available product that is uh, the price tag is, is uh, economically in that level that that building owners are able to make the investment and, and so that the heat pump uh, with a reasonable, reasonably good COP can produce the required temperatures. Can, can you share with us what that means? I mean, what is a reasonably good COP for you and, um, and what capacity do you need? Okay, so basically what we need in this kind of setup is that the, the, the prime side temperature is somewhere around 10 degrees, five to 10 degrees plus, plus Celsius. So it's, it's better than normal in ground source heat pumps. It's a higher temperature. So yeah. then if we, if we get the heat pump, which actually are there, uh, that can then raise the temperature from this level to 75, 80 degrees and, and the COP 2.5 or something, that probably starts to be a economically uh, reasonable level. And when, especially when you connect it together with the solar panels that you get the part of the electricity from solar panels as much as possible in summertime, especially in Finland, then you actually can increase the system COP uh, over three, close to four even. Or uh, annual, let's say season, seasonal, annual COP, average COP. And then, okay. then the production cost would be low enough so that the utilities are willing to buy it and you can actually make some profit as a seller. 
And how long do you think could the utility go uh, in terms of the temperature of the district heating grid? You mean how? What is the highest temperature? Or, one one, or... one way would be to say, okay, you need, need to bring in a heat pump that can provide higher temperature. The other way is to say, can is is maybe in the future the district heating grid renovated to a level so that it can operate at a lower temperature? R right. Yeah, that's right. So this low, lower temperature uh, networks are already piloted also in Finland, in Turku, for example, and I guess in in here in Tampere also. Uh, of course, in longer run in future, grids will be in lower temperature. But I would say that it's a very long time to to say that every big cities in Europe or Finland who has a district heating network are lower temperatures. So it's, okay. it's a big big change. So we have we have been focusing on trying to get a, a scalable solution on the market that can really supply to current networks, which requires higher, higher temperatures. Okay. Janet, yes. may I invite you to contact me later on, because the temperatures <laughs> you're mentioning are the ones we are actually already running on for over seven or eight years. So Absolutely. I might yeah. have a solution for you there. This okay. is one uh, for this uh, webinar already. <laughs> okay, um, sounds good. So uh, I, we, I have some info for you, and uh, maybe it's uh, beneficial for you. But uh, maybe, you, you maybe Jochen, you want to still uh, share with us what the temperature is that you can provide, because I was going to say that we are running currently. Uh, we are partners in a project that's called the dry efficiency. It's it's not for the building sector, but it could very well be used for the building sector because it has a heat pump that can provide 160 degrees uh, Celsius and also steam. So this is possible, yeah. and, and uh, as far as I understand, an efficiency of 2.5 seems to be uh, also in the range of the possibilities uh, here. And I am also uh, talking to another party, the, this company, MIN Energy Solutions. I don't know if you remember that they were also at our conference. And they have, but, but that's why I was asking about the capacity. They have a huge capacity, uh, several megawatts, uh, 10 and even more of thermal, so thermal energy. So far too much for a single building. But if, it, if we're talking about the city, then it becomes interesting and they can do 120, maybe 130 degrees with a turbo compressor. Mm -hmm. so, so what's your, well, your, your take, Jochen? Well, um, we have the first stage and then we can have a temperature lift of approximately 70 K. And uh, that's up to 75, 80 degrees per stage. And then I'm familiar with the producer, I guess you're talking about as well. And they can run uh, the temperature with a source temperature of 80 degrees up to 160 degrees and producing yeah. steam. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So that's actually the second stage. But for district heating purposes or renovation projects for retrofit, uh, the temperatures of, let's say, up to 80 degrees are usually uh, sufficient for um, uh, putting the ga gas burner outside and putting a heat pump in this project. Okay, we have one very question now. We have let ourselves be swept away. Um, Phil Shepard, it seems. Yeah, I am unmuting you, Phil. If you could briefly ask a question. Uh, yeah, what are the what are the economics um, of this? I mean, you, you've just discussed them, but um, I mean, what what the, the ultimate question is what's the what's the payback what's the return on investment yeah that's a good question in this particular project this is a, this is a kind of pilot project which was like i mentioned in the beginning it was funded partly with the eu as uh, support so and and of course because this is kind of uh, piloting and testing something quite new thing in in this scale uh, this this is not economically uh, really a good good showcase, and it it has been more expensive than it normally should be. But I would I would uh, assume that if we get such a heat pump that can really work on these uh, support these requirements on temperatures, and if if the price tag is same level as the standard heat pump. Uh, with let's say 100 kilowatt capacity, 100 let's say 
a little bit less 100 up to the 200 kilowatts capacity heat pump that are there on the market today for commercial buildings. If we get in that price, price point uh, uh, technology that can, and with this capacity level can produce higher temperatures, then I would assume that uh, there is an economical uh, approach really quite, quite good. Uh, especially if you support it by, by solar panels, because that's the, that basically you need solar panels to get the free electricity as much as possible to increase the COP. Okay, thank I you very much. COP. <laughs> thank you very much, Janne. Uh, we have now uh, met the, the time limit for this session, and I would like to hand over to Richard to hear about uh, the district heating and uh, dairy connection. Richard. Yes, hello. Hello, Richard, we hear you. Just a second. Yes, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Yes, just, perfect. Just, just a perfect. second, I'm sharing your screen. So, yeah. good okay. morning, everyone. I am uh, pleased to. Um, be allowed to make the presentation for the heat pump city of the world uh, 2019 the decarb industry category and the winner as you know tina bergen and the new projects in norway mm -hmm. um, tina's ambitions is to be the best in sustainability within the norwegian food industry the combination of heating and cooling is a good starting point for finding good and energy efficient solutions um just very briefly tina sa it's a cooperative owned by norwegian milk producers as a matter of fact more than one ten thousand of them there are 31 dairies in norway and seven subsidiaries in six foreign countries main products are milk cheese and other dairy products and the annual turnover in 2018 was uh, 23.5 billion Norwegian kroner. Employees, 5,355. Um, the Tina Bergen has been presented as the greenest dairy in Europe. Mm -hmm. Tina is modernizing the dairy industry. They are working to find the most modern solution for energy use and for the environment. All heat and cooling supplies by cooling machines and heat pumps in interaction. And uh, the dairy is complete uh, within, uh, without fossil or direct electric heating. The consumption can be reduced by almost five gigawatt hours annually. And it's expected to have a 40% reduction in energy consumption including 59 tons of CO2 uh, emission reductions. The Norwegian uh, supporting company, Enova, has um, supported the project with 16.4 million Norwegian kroner. Tina is also the winner of Norwegian heat pump in addition to, to what has been given by your heat pump association. Going a little bit into the technical side, um, this sketch shows a traditional dairy where you have a separated cooling and heating arrangements. You see on the chiller side, uh, you have the posters, rinse milk and compressors adding in, in uh, energy. And then you have preheating of water, dry coolers when needed uh, with excessive heat and then snow smelting. And of course, for the process support, you have a supply. On the warm side, you have the um, fossil fuel boiler, a steam boiler, up to 100, 120 degrees Celsius. It supplies hot water and building heat. And of course, what is required for the operation of the dairy, CIP, posture, and other high temperature needs. When looking at um, Tina Bergen, it is an integrated energy recovery 
system using heat pumps. You see that the chillers are still there and you have on the on the warm side an electrical boiler serving as a backup unit. In the between, you have um, conventional ammonia operated heat pumps and you have the hybrid heat pump that can supply temperatures in this case up to 95 degrees celsius um, there is a, a lot of storage or accumulator tanks um, you see here at the different uh, temperature ratios and um, it's taking care of the same uh, features as we looked at the basic sketch but we have a complete collection of um, waste heat and low temperature heat that you can bring up to the correct levels to make it work. Uh, you see that there is also a link to the district heating. Uh, the question is, uh, Tina will probably be a small customer regarding energy needs in the future and also possibilities to supply uh, energy to the system. If you look at some technical details, uh, the max capacity of the hybrid heat pump is 940 kilowatts with a, a planned uh, COP of 5.4. The max capacity of the ammonia heat pumps, two of them, is 1577 kilowatts. And max capacity of the chiller plants, including three chillers, is 2400 kilowatts. The thermal storage, as I mentioned, you see there are four storage tanks of 130 cubic meters, and then there are two on the cold side of 60 cubic meters. The success factors that can be um, mentioned in this respect is that Tina has through the years made several research projects with uh, companies like HIF and HEATUP uh, system. They have a long tradition working with ANOVA for support to their projects. And they have also research partners like Sintef in Trondheim. And not at least suppliers and cooperative partners like uh, Sveco and AF Group, consultant and building contractors, Kronos AG and Milkron GmbH, machinery installations, process equipment, and energy central, and hybrid energy, delivery of hybrid heat pump, heat pumps, and refrigeration plants, including the control system. And the components are manufactured by Johnson Controls and Sabro uh, in the energy central. The solutions are based on conventional knowledge, but the overall composition ensures that the project goes beyond the availability in technology at the moment. This is a photo shows um, the hybrid heat pump skid in position at Tina Bergen. And a second photo shows the human machine interface control area. A little background about hybrid energy. Um, it was emerged from the Institute for Technology, IFE in Norway, founded in 2004, and commissioned plants in dairies, abattoirs, uh, slaughterhouses, fish feed producers, biogas production plant, district heating, process industry, and more. To date, we have 17 high temperature heat pump systems commissioned and a proven technology with more than half a million operational hours. What is a hybrid pump? In very brief, it's a natural working medium, 50-50% water and ammonia. Can deliver 120 degrees at low pressure. Then we talk about 25 bar. It yields exceptional COPs, especially with large glides, delta T's on hot and cold side, and it uses standard refrigeration equipment. And finally, but not at least, offers unique flexibility after commissioning. Just briefly a comment on that. 
we can change the mixture ratio between water and ammonia and correct the operation of the system when we see how the real temperatures will be. It's a, it's a considerable benefit comparing to pure ammonia systems that are more or less locked to design temperatures. In brief, um, the technology basis, there are main uh, core main components. It's the condenser, it's the expansion valve, it's the evaporator, and it's the compressor. What makes a, a hybrid pump special is that there is a gas liquid separation tank and the, the gas is of course handled by the compressor. The liquid mixture liquid is handled by the solution pump. And um, the large benefits as mentioned is that we can um, achieve very high temperatures working at moderate pressures and, um, and uh, with uh, then better operational conditions for all machinery equipment. Briefly about the hybrid heat pump family, the company was established in 2004 and today we have three basic uh, products. The green pack is a one-stage hybrid heat pump, delivers temperatures up to 100 degrees Celsius. The high pack R is a piston-operated uh, um, hybrid system, delivers up to 120 degree, degrees Celsius, and it's a two-stage with two compressors. And then finally, we have the high pack S. It's a screw compressor-based unit for larger capacities up to five megawatts and can also deliver temperatures up to 120 degrees Celsius. The two units I uh, mentioned first are specially designed for dairy purposes and have a, a capacity of a limitation for two megawatts. The green pack, which is the one that has been installed at Tina Bergen, have the typical applications as you can see here for dairy and has it normally source temperature 60 degrees and up to 100 degrees and a power range of 500 to 2 megawatts and the cop depending on operational conditions are in the area of 5 to 8. the hypoc r have the typical applications for the dairy and it can bring a source temperature up to 120 degrees Capacity range 750 to 2 megawatt and a COP level at 3 to 5. This is uh, in brief what we plan to inform you. Um, we are ready to answer any questions you may have later during the question and answer section, and I will then be joined by uh, our technical uh, CTO. Stein Rune Nordtvedt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. The, this, this was very interesting, um, and I'm sure we have questions. I suggest we continue as you suggest. We will leave the questions until uh, your technical director joins, and we continue now directly with Jochem um, to hear about the uh, PHAC project. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Um, the system, uh, FAC system, is not as much uh, a new product, uh, but it's a combination of uh, our products and third-party products to have a, a system design that can be uh, replicated or scaled up uh, in a number of situations across Europe. Uh, Energy Tech, uh, we are an independent developer producer of heat pumps. We were established in 2010 and we specialize in modulating heat pumps uh, with our own developed software uh, we can reach high temperatures uh, and we can cope with high source temperatures as well within the same machine the fact system 
um, is based on the principle that you should use energy when it is available. When solving our energy problem in Europe, it's not uh, about searching for energy because there's plenty of energy already available. It is uh, when to use it, how to use it and store it for the time you need it. In this case, we use solar energy, our main uh, source of energy. Um, and we use for collecting the solar energy, we use PVT panels. So we are both producing electricity and collecting thermal energy as well. And this is, of course, in summertime. Um, the FAC system, in fact, is an abbreviation of passive heating, active cooling. So we're now on the part of active cooling. In summertime, we run the heat pump on the electricity produced by the PV panels. And if there's no source available, uh, there's no need for cooling the building, then we use the energy provided by the thermal uh, panels from the roof. So we can pr provide cooling for the building and run the uh, heat pump on the electricity produced by the PV panels. Of course, our waste product, so to speak, uh, is heat and we need to store this heat in a thermal storage. There are uh, uh, heat pipes or PVT panels um, uh, providing the energy for the whole system. Then we use our high temperature heat pump. It can cope with these various source temperatures. Uh, it, it can go as low as, of course, five degrees, but it can go as high as up to 30 or 40 degrees Celsius. We can uh, run the heat pump with the source temperatures and provide a output temperature of up to 80 degrees Celsius. This output is stored in the thermal storage. This is on the right uh, lower corner. And this, in fact, is a thermal storage system which is placed underground. Um, it is uh, quite cost effective and it is uh, filled with plain water. We have tried several different solutions, for instance, PCM materials, but we feel that water, just plain water, is uh, for now the best thermal storage because you can pump it, it is at low cost and it's not poisonous, so to speak. So we use thermal storage underground. Um, if this is installed, you can put your car above it or you can make it as a parking place so it doesn't need uh, uh, much uh, room. Um, in winter time, of course, the whole system, or at least the heat pump, is uh, shut off. The panels won't produce uh, much uh, energy, but some electricity to run our pumps. And in wintertime, we are uh, transporting the stored heat from the energy storage to the building. Of course, most beneficial, this is used in combination with a low temperature heating system for instance, radiant floor heating uh, or so, because we start at a temperature of up to 80 degrees in the thermal storage, and it would be very nice to prolong the usage period of the thermal storage when you can feed the uh, heating system with up to 35 degrees. Of course, each summertime and each wintertime differs from year to year, so maybe when we did the calculations right, but the winter is still uh, a bit longer than on average, then we have a backup uh, because the thermal storage, when temperatures drop below, let's say, 35 degrees Celsius, so we can't feed in on the heating system directly, then we uh, uh, charge or put in the heat pump as well. We change flow directions and we use the thermal storage as a source for the heat pump so it can run at a very high COP and still provide the needed temperature for the heating system.
In this way, we can guarantee that with this system, the building will be cooled and will be heated with uh, uh, heat pump technology and uh, indirectly with solar energy. The most solar solutions out there, they can't provide any cooling because they're producing just heat in this system. This combination of systems, we can provide cooling as well. And we feel that, especially in the newly built, uh, uh, new builds, cooling is even more important than heating. So we need needed cooling. There is an extra, uh, in addition to that, there's an extra benefit. Um, in Holland, we are uh, um, already uh, uh, experiencing that in a lot of renovation projects, there is not enough electricity available just to put in a heat pump and replace the natural gas burner. With this system, we provide both the heat energy, but also the electricity. In fact, with this system, uh, because there's no direct connection between heating hours and heating capacity, but it's more about how much solar hours do you have available in summertime, and of course your cooling capacity, we can design the heat pump on the cooling capacity and run a lot of hours during summertime to collect all the heat needed for heating in the wintertime. So in effect, in a lot of projects, we can use a smaller heat pump system with, in addition, a smaller connection to the electricity grid uh, uh, for uh, providing heating and cooling in this building. The project we uh, entered in the competition, the project in Achtmaal, in fact, this was privately funded. Uh, it is all about economics, as you already uh, was mentioned during the session. Well, in this case, um, it's, uh, of course, depending on the pricing of energy in the Netherlands. Electricity is uh, quite uh, cheap, although uh, at least for uh, this kind of uh, uh, installations, and we have natural gas, but pricing uh, pricing of natural gas is picking up. So the alternative is getting uh, more expensive. And in fact, our government will probably today uh, present plans to lower taxation on electricity. Um, today, so this is beneficial. Like why we speak? Did you say today? Um, yeah, probably today. Um, but I know that in, uh, for instance, Germany or in Belgium, pricing uh, of uh, electricity and natural gas it, it differs quite a lot from the pricing in, in Holland. So I think that in each uh, market, you should look at the possibilities uh, for uh, making new combinations of heat pump technology with PVT or storage uh, uh, facilities as well. Uh, to combine it to a working system, but the system as uh, as done in Achmal, it can be uh, reproduced uh, at, uh, in several different places. We are using it for um, apartment buildings as well, and then the roof surface area or the roof area um, of a six-story building is sufficient to run this system. So oh. we have a lot of uh, inquiries for uh, retrofit or renovation projects of existing apartment buildings as well. Okay, very interesting. Thank you for your attention and um, maybe if there are any questions or later on I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Are there any questions in the audience at the moment? I see here what's the size and the cost of the underground asks Thomas Knoll. Mm -hmm. Size and cost of the underground storage, I think it's supposed to be. Yeah, well, it's a, a, a flexible, scalable thermal storage. Um, it has no supporting walls. It has a construction within the thermal storage, so it can carry uh, a lot of uh, load on top of it later on when it is covered with at least a meter of soil. Mm -hmm. um, the smallest uh, thermal storage uh, put in is approximately 100 cubic meters. 
which has a, a dimensions of a five by five and it's approximately uh, three and a half four meters uh, in depth and there, therefore the whole system will be uh, uh, five meters high or four and a half meters high but as mentioned you can put it underground and uh, build a parking lot above it and Thomas Noll is asking, uh, no, uh, Phil Shepard is asking, what percentage of the winter demand did the thermos store provide? I understand 100%, right? You said that. Well, when combined with, for instance, heat pipes, or uh, uh, then we do the calculations, and on average, we store up to 50, maybe 60% of the total heating demand in wintertime because especially uh, on uh, the first period of heating season and uh, uh, on the end of the heating, se heating, system, heating season, then the system can uh, directly provide you with enough temperature uh, to run directly on the heating system. But it's all about the orientation of the PVT system uh, and of course the location of the project. We do the calculations and uh, in general it's uh, not more than 60 percent of the total heating demand in winter time and, and then the heat pump kicks in after that so the system itself provides 100 yeah, percent of the heat yeah yeah, okay. yeah. when start on the heating system we we run on the energy or heat produced by the system itself on this the same moment uh, in midwinter there's no not much solar energy so the storage will uh, be um, asked to provide all the heating and at the end of heating system as you mentioned thomas if there is still a heating demand we can uh, uh, change flow directions and uh, start a heat pump if necessary but we try to have a uh, passive heating system <coughs> and not run the heat pump for heating purposes okay uh, yeah but you run for cooling so that that's likewise fine um yeah then but we, we do it with electricity produced on the same moment uh, you know what I really like about all these projects is that they, they push the system integration so much forward. So we're not no longer discussing should we use the heat pump or not. We're basically discussing how do we bring the energy system down to no emissions and increase the the uh, amount of self-produced uh, electricity either from the building itself or from the direct vicinity. Let me say thank you to Janne who has to leave. I will also say thank you to Jochen. I don't see any further questions for the moment. We will make the presentations uh, available and also your contact details are on them. So then people can contact you directly. And I, and I think, understand that uh, Janne and, uh, and Jochen, you have to talk anyhow afterwards. So you have to do that bilaterally. And we come to the last presentation, which is done by Nate. I have to ask, how do I say that properly? Nate? Nate? It is Nate. Nate. So Nate Breli Wasowski, which has uh, now getting the prize for the most complicated name in this session this morning, but uh, <laughs> I hope you also have a very interesting presentation for us, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, just a moment so that I uh, move this. Okay, now you should uh, be able to see my screen. It's on. So, uh, yes, hello everyone. My name is uh, Nate Brilifasowski, and I'm a knowledge manager at uh, Boydness Engineering. And uh, I'm very happy that I can present to all of you the, the project uh, uh, winner in the DCAR building category. Uh, and this is uh, a project of a, build of a building in uh, Belgium, in uh, Turnhout to be more precise, and it's called Turnova. So um, about this building, it's a <clears throat> it's a, a, a urban development. So a building that um, or a site that consists of residential, commercial, retail, education, leisure, and monument functions, and it's a, a brownfield type of uh, project. So um, it is a, a redevelopment of a of an existing of a former um building site that was really used um and there was a, a printing facility at, uh, at that site so um currently the the project is still in um the last 
construction phase or the last uh, yeah, moments of the, the construction phase. And it's already part of it. And the final handover is expected uh, to be at the end of, uh, of, of this year. Now, it's rather large development because the total uh, project surface is uh, just about 100,000 uh, square meters. Um, which is quite a bit for, for a Belgian scale of, of projects. And uh, uh, the whole project uh, was designed by um, four architectural offices. These were the OSAR architects, B architects, Lens S and uh, Baumschlager Everle. And the uh, development uh, of the project was done by uh, the Heren, Armada and the city of turn out in a uh, public-private partnership. Uh, the general contractor of the, the project was uh, Interbuilt. It's a, it's a Belgian company. And um, the energy concept and resources design was done by our company, so Boydens Engineering. Uh, at that point, I can maybe say a bit more about uh, our company. We are uh, determined to design buildings that are fossil-free. Um, we have um, done quite many such, um, we're tr trying to do as many as uh, possible uh, such buildings in, in Belgium and in Luxembourg, um, where we are one of the market leaders when it comes to such designs. And we see uh, heat pumps as an essential solution in reaching carbon-free society. And we use a lot of uh, heat pumps in, in our in our projects. Almost every project there is a heat pump in it. And we have also um, very rich experience in designing um, ground source heat pump systems. So maybe a word uh, or two about the, the site history. So since uh, 1797 until uh, 74 in, 22, in the 20th century, the site was occupied by a Brepols printing, com printing company. But um, after 1974, when the site uh, and the printing company uh, closed, there were four hectares of uh, land uh, available in the city, which was um, degenerated, uh, a lot of degenerated buildings. And there were, in the meantime, several failed redevelopment attempts uh, that unfortunately weren't able to redevelop the, the site. So finally, in uh, 2004, uh, the city in, of uh, Turnhout um, had an idea about uh, a new idea about the re redevelopment of this um, site. And so they found a partner in the Heerling Group and they prepared also a master plan for the redevelopment of the new city district. Um, then in 2006, uh, the city again uh, found a developer, Armada, and they presented the project, which eventually in 2007 was uh, approved. Uh, so the, the whole founding of the project was, uh, as already mentioned before, uh, in um, public a private partnership between the city of Turnhout and uh, the Armada project development. And there was also a subsidy of 3.2 million euros by the Flemish Urban Renewal uh, Fund that was also used. Um, so about the purpose of this project, um, the main purpose was to um, redevelop and revitalize the, the city center. Um, the project is located very close to, to the city center, but not in the very city center. Um, and uh, there is, uh, the, the site is very well connected with uh, the main old uh, city center. There's a lot of bus lines uh, uh, connecting it uh, to it. So, um, and it's also walking distance from the railway station. So the whole site is accessible from to everyone uh, in the region that can reach the site easily by, by public transport. Now, the functions that are available here on the site uh, in, as part of the, the project development is a, a shopping center, a hotel, uh, then there is an, uh, an urban art academy, there, is, uh, there are housings, about uh, 250 apartments ranging from um, social housing uh, to luxury apartments. 
Uh, there is an underground parking for cars and bikes. There are cafes, restaurants, movie theater, fitness, wellness, terraces, etc. So as you can see here, lots of very different functions that also have quite different energy needs. Uh, and uh, when it comes to energy needs, the needs are not at the same time. So they're quite dispersed in, in time. Um, so, since there are so different functions, the, um, the question that we had and how we tried to solve it was to find a solution that would work well, taking into account that different um, functions of, of the site. So, the energy concept is based on, on four main pillars. Um, the main one, uh, the first one is the aquifer thermal energy storage system. Then there is a collective thermal distribution loop that connects the aquifer thermal energy stories with the centralized heat pump units for heating and cooling that are locally producing the heat. And uh, on top of that, there are still the PV panels that are there to produce electricity to compensate for the electricity used by the heat pumps. You can see here on the, the picture that uh, how different functions are um, of the buildings are connected to one loop, which is acting as a, as a central way of distributing the heat from the uh, uh, ground source heat exchanger towards the buildings uh, on the site. <clears throat> now about the aquifer thermal energy storage system, what this allows us is that uh, depending on the, the wind on the, um, the year season that we have, so it's either summer or winter, um, one can inject uh, the heat in uh, one of the boreholes that are on the side. So in fact, in total, we have six boreholes, but these are three pairs of, uh, um, and each there is uh, one borehole which is uh, called a uh, cold source and another one that is called, uh, uh, called uh, a hot source. So uh, the total capacity of uh, a pair is uh, 100 cubic meters per hour. So in total we have 300 cubic meters per hour of capacity, which amounts to more or less 4.5 uh, megawatt uh, peak capacity that is available. The spacing between the, the pairs is uh, more than 70 meters and the borehole depth is 100 to 130 meters. Now, since we are quite close here uh, to, the, to the Dutch border and the, the soil properties and the aquifer properties are quite good here, so we can extract a lot of flow uh, just uh, through one borehole. So you can see here on the, the, the left, the bottom left, sorry, bottom right picture, uh, an example of how uh, locally on the east side of the um, wells there is a zone of cold and hot uh, storage that is created. So it's a, a ground aquifer temperature which is elevated or uh, which is decreased locally. This is not from, from this project but just to, to illustrate. So what is happening here in fact is that in summer, um, when there is more cooling necessary, we produce more hot water, and that hot water is injected on the site of the uh, warm boreholes. Whereas in uh, the winter, when we have to heat and there is more uh, cold water that is produced, the cold water is injected in the, in the cold sources. And of course, in the um, meantime, so in, in, in spring and in autumn, the systems can be uh, switched over from one to the other on the needs of, of the building. Now about that uh, collective thermal distribution loop, we have a, a three pipe system. So we have one main distribution pipe, which is supplying temperature at uh, around 11 degrees Celsius to the uh, decentralized heating pumps. And this water can either be used by the heat pumps to produce cold water, and then the return temperature will be uh, 18 degrees, or to produce hot water on the secondary side, and then the return temperature will be around five degrees. With the water at 11 degrees, it can also be used for free cooling if the temperature is low enough for the um, 
the, uh, the secondary uh, systems. The advantage of such a uh, distrib distribution loop is that it is of low temperature, so there is there are almost no um, line heat losses. Um, it allows also for simultaneous heating and cooling in the system, uh, which is compensated internally in the loop. It is also avoiding um, on-site fossil fuel combustion and CO2 emissions and um, there is a direct heat transfer in the community as already mentioned between the, the heating and, and, and cooling part. Now since there is um, there is also no heat rejected to the outside but everything goes in the ground uh, and because we also have green roofs uh, on the buildings uh, we in the summertime we can avoid having the heat island effect um, which is quite problematic in cities nowadays. And there are also no CO2 emissions in the, in the vicinity or in the neighborhood of uh, the site. So that also helps the uh, air quality uh, around the development area. Now about that decentralized heat pumps, um, there, there is quite a wide range in powers that are installed ranging from small uh, heat pumps installed uh, as individual units in, in apartments ranging just for a few kilowatts up to several uh, hundred kilowatts of heat pumps that are used for um, larger uh, buildings in the development such as a hotel or a shopping center or big, big air handling units. We can see here on, on uh, these three pictures um, examples of those heat pumps, how they are located in the building and how there is a loop, uh, uh, so the piping that is connecting them. So, <clears throat> now, maybe still to explain something more about that uh, decentralized heating pumps, uh, heat pumps that are used here, there can be two types that can be used. So the first one is either with uh, the passing cooling, as it can be seen in, in this example. So what we have here is that the middle pipe at 11 degrees Celsius uh, in magenta color, uh, it can either be distributed towards a heat exchanger, uh, a local heat exchanger, and then directly used for cooling uh, of, a, of a building on the secondary size, or it can be used uh, on the secondary heat, on the, on the other heat exchanger, um, and there is a heat pump on the secondary side. Um, we have also, in that case uh, of heat pumps, 10% uh, of ethylene glycol, uh, uh, so that there is, uh, if there is a freezing danger, that uh, there is no, uh, there is no freezing in, in the heat exchanger of the, the heat pump. Now, the second um, possibility that is also applied on, on the site, these are the um, uh, heat pumps with active uh, cooling. So what happens here is that um, there is a switchover valve uh, on the, the site of the, the secondary site of the heat pump. And depending on the mode that the heat pump is in, so in heating and cooling, uh, the water will then be distributed to the right heat exchanger so that it can be uh, rejected back into the loop. Now, one may ask a question, why do we need a loop here with three pipes? Because we could also do a two pipe loop and that is also done on some projects. The reason, the main reason for this is that if we use a three pipe system with a separate uh, return piping, then we can um, really make sure that the return temperature is either very hot or as, as, as high as possible or as low as possible. And when we want to inject that water uh, back into the aquifer thermal energy system, we can make sure that we are injecting just cold or hot water. And the temperature difference between um, the hot or the cold water must be as high as possible because then we get a lot of storage, seasonal storage capacity in the, uh, in the aquifer thermal energy system. 
and that Nate, is the in the course. sense of time I'm, I'm sorry but we this is getting very technical i see you understand this very well <laughs> I this have is the last to last slide jump over that yes yes so that that is the the, the technical behind it uh, uh, and i would just like to finish here with uh, with a quote that uh, rome was not built in a day but we will have to much 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 faster uh, building by building, if you want to move to decarb heat. And heat pumps are an essential piece of the solution that will be, uh, that will enable us to, to achieve that uh, in the future. That's, that's how we, we see it in Bordis Engineering. So thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Nate. This was a perfect handover to uh, a, a very important question that I have, and I guess many others. You showed the timeline of this project, and the first <clears> planning <throat> was 2004, and now you said it's 2019, and you're still finalizing the last bits and pieces. So, a planning horizon of 15 years, and maybe that's also a question I would like to ask to everybody. How can we speed this up if we have to do 15 years for every project? we for sure will not have enough manpower to execute that because it binds too much resources uh, before the project is done. And before, of course, you and Boydens and other companies can do another project. Yeah, we, this is maybe an, an exceptional uh, case of a project that took so much so much time, especially also because it's so big, because it's uh, the whole site development. But mm, we can see in other of our projects, which are smaller, but we even have like examples of buildings that are 50,000 square meters and the whole development from the idea to the realization can be made in three to four years maximum. So it really depends, but if there is a need and there is a will to go quick, we can do it really quickly. Okay, any comments from the other uh, presenters? What about your own timelines? Do you, can you, do you see that, are you fast enough? What's limiting higher speed? Can you speed up yourself? Just Sorry, to come, well, yeah, just a comment from uh, hybrid, hybrid energy. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, the limitation for us is uh, not the manufacturing time for components because we are talking about around half a year. Or um, uh, yeah, so so uh, the normal time is the building contractor uh, uh, progress plans and uh, and uh, and process equipment. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have a, uh, yeah, I have yeah. a different view. I think the limitation is not uh, as much uh, at uh, parties like us, producers, installers, engineers. It's uh, always a question about uh, our customers, but uh, uh, more, than, more than that, it's about a government legislation and pricing of alternative uh, energy sources. And yeah. I don't know about uh, the other countries in Europe, but in Holland, uh, energy prices, uh, more than half of it is taxation. So if politicians really want to make a change, uh, I'm not saying they, they should uh, uh, get less taxation in, but maybe they should uh, have an alternative way of taxation, different energy sources, and make it viable or economical for our customers to make a change. I think we don't have to uh, approve our points, but politicians, uh, they should uh, make a stand and take some action because well, they're talking a lot. Let's hope that the Dutch uh, government is taking a right decision today and I can confirm to you that in uh, 20 of 28 European countries electricity is taxed much much higher in absolute terms than oil and gas and so it is really a burden and it's actually punishing the energy source that is getting greener and greener. Uh, we have a few questions here uh, on, on the, the issue of PVT versus PV versus solar thermal collectors. And since you all had one of or, the, or both of the, them in place, what, a, what is the answer there? Is, is PVT collectors an opportunity for any of these projects? Uh, what's the question for, Thomas? Uh, no, for all of you. For the, the, this is a question by... Um, uh, I think by yeah, it's a bit difficult to go through these questions. 
Anyhow, it's a question that, that says, what about, what about PVT versus uh, so, uh, PV collectors, uh, so electricity versus uh, solar thermal versus PVT, combined collectors? Do they make sense in, uh, in your respective products, uh, projects? They all make sense. And we select uh, different techniques uh, for different projects depending on the temperatures uh, needed uh, and also on the profile of when they are needed. So sometimes we use the PVT, sometimes we use just PV and have uh, uh, heat pipes or other techniques in to provide higher temperatures. And there's of course always the, the point of orientation and how much space do you have available. So it depends. Yep. They have different uh, uh, aspects to each product, different temperatures. So. In turn I don't know out, how is that? Yeah. We we just had PV panels, um, but in general, that the the choice will really, as mentioned as mentioned by by Johan, will depend on what is the best for for the the project. So we also have the cases when we have uh, the combined PV, uh, or just the, the PV panels. It it really depends, but it's a technology that all the technologies are, are useful, um, but uh, comes down to the, the the local case that will decide which which one to use. Mm -hmm. Very good. We have um, Cordin Apagaus here. I don't know, Cordin, maybe you want to ask your question yourself and I will just quickly free you. Uh, oh, this is, my machine is not doing it. So Cordin, you're online if you ah. want to ask your question. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm Gordin uh, Arpagaus from Switzerland and I am interested in how you can reach the customer or how, how is the, the selling process of such a big investment uh, of a heat pump. Maybe you can <laughs> explain uh, the steps which are involved and what are the decision criteria that they finally buy the heat pump and not uh, a gas boiler or some <clears throat> other uh, made on fossil fuel uh, system. Maybe I can uh, say for for larger projects, uh, we can cannot comment for uh, maybe housing because in housing, <clears throat> I think the, the the customer is more direct directly related to um, to manufacturer through sellers. But at least when it comes to large developments. Um, the design offices and consultants, we, we play a, a very big role here and it really depends on what kind of solution a, a consultant or design office proposes to, to the client and how it is presented and how you, you have to make a special effort to, or sometimes also to convince the client and to show the client why is it better to use a heat pump and not a, a a condensing gas boiler or some of the, the fossil fuel technologies. But normally to mm, really show that uh, heat pumps can shine, you have to come with an integrated solution that is the best for, for the given project. Uh, it's very difficult to sell just heat pump as such. Um, so we see that we are much more successful when we present that as, as a package, as a complete solution. And I think that for large systems, this is, this is the way to, to go forward think that without uh, a big support of a consultant, it is difficult just uh, for a manufacturer or representative of the manufacturer to sell something which will not be integrated in the, the whole solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, from, from our experience, um, the main criteria is that the customer has uh, waste heat or excessive heat that can be made available. And then we need also to identify that they have a, a need for heat on the other side. So, um, so uh, we have to look for clients and then we are mainly working with uh, industrial uh, clients. And um, we are then trying to, to spread the message like we are doing today and, uh, and approaching, of course, uh, uh, we have mentioned here dairies. We are working with slaughterhouses. We are working with... Um, chemical industry, uh, preheating of, of um, uh, uh, 
boiler water and things like that. So, so there are many applications, but um, I, I mean, these basic needs have to be, of course, very logical present that they have an excessive heat that we can use and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, bring up to a higher level. And then they have to have the requirement to heat. Thank you. This hands over very nicely to a question by Mike Langen. Mike, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. You want to ask your question yourself, please? Uh, I was just waiting. You've mentioned lots of different uh, hybrid systems with different technologies linking together. I was just wondering, could you discuss some of the technical challenges that you've had integrating with other renewable technologies? Yeah. I guess that's uh, that allows a brief statement from all the speakers. Uh, well, <laughs> if I may, um, the uh, especially the the technical challenges with the fax system as presented in this uh, webinar were the quite a broad range of temperatures on the source sides and uh, somewhat uh, on the load side uh, reaching the high uh, temperatures but that's a technique we are already familiar with uh, but it's not common in heat pump uh, um, uh, sales or product products um, and that's uh, for us the main thing to integrate all these different uh, features of different products different techniques to one and there's uh, a large demand for uh, uh, software so we do our own software as well uh, uh, and our software programmers they understand heat pumps I think that's that's the main thing or a, a great uh, advantage to, for integrating all these different techniques yeah and that's an interesting point how, how do you see that Richard is that uh, are you do you have more software developers than hardware welders in your company <laughs> I think this is a good opportunity for to introduce our uh, CTO Steinrune Nordtvedt. He wants to comment on this oh, yeah. item. Please, I, please. I really agree uh, um, that you need a lot of automation and software because you have to balance the heat sources and the heat sinks over the year. So then, to integrate all this technology and uh, to make it run smoothly, you. Need Good software. So the heat pump, the heating and cooling industry will become uh, uh, the next will benefit from the next IT revolution. You think? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think so. And Nate, uh, you you showed us very sophisticated graphs. I guess you haven't drawn them by yourself, and they're not the result of your the children or or other kids doing a drawing competition. So how do you come to that? So, so how do I come to, to what to to the, the schematic? I mean, graphs. I mean, yeah, exactly. You don't paint them, right? This is sophisticated. Yeah, it's sophisticated. Yeah, but um, of course we, we we come up with that. I mean, it's it's building on on the existing knowledge of hydraulics that we already had. Um, but it's not just hydraulics. I mean, what um, Richard and Johan mentioned, the uh, automation part of it, it's, it's really, really important to make the, the hydraulics work as, as they're supposed. And uh, this is really one of the challenges that we are facing now. And it's very difficult to get uh, correct uh, operation of, of the system uh, in, in, in the field. Because we are, in fact, work, dealing with very complex state machines uh, in the field that are um, very difficult to, uh, to control. Okay, well, so that, that leaves us with an upbeat and a <clears throat> bit of a challenge. I think we, we have seen that the potential of uh, heat pumps is there. Heat pumps in integrated systems is even better because then we can move faster in the direction of decarbonized and zero emission systems. Uh, we have learned that software is essential and I would say, and I would dare say that also the visualization from software will be essential to convince end users and decision makers that these systems are well founded in science and can work as promised. With that, I would like to thank all of you for your time this morning. I hope that we uh, make a little bit of an impact. We had uh, somewhere around 50 participants over the course of the morning. and. 
we will present we will make the presentations available as pdf unless any of you object so if you don't want any of the slides that you showed to be seen then please let alfredo know and he will take them out the rest we will publish as it is thank you very much have a nice rest of the day and enjoy the weekend thank, thank you very much bye 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 bye